Hello. Hello, everyone. I am Claudia Vance, Department Chair of Foreign Languages. I want to thank everyone for attending today. Before I turn the program over to Dr. Matthew Price, I want to acknowledge a couple of people. I appreciate Dr. Ross Alexander, Vice President of Academic Affairs and Provost for attending up there. Thank you. And I also appreciate the College of Business for their collaboration and putting this together. Um, finally, I want to thank Dr. David Sanseri for his support of the Sanseri Speaker Series in the College of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Sanseri is a UNA graduate in the Department of Chemistry, and he started this series to honor his sister, Jennifer Sanseri. Now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Matthew Price to introduce our speaker and to moderate the program. Okay. Uh, thank you all for coming on this cool autumn day. Um, so uh, I want to thank you all for being here. It is really my pleasure to introduce Heather Manso, Vice President of Product Development and Commercialization at Carter's. But I take special pleasure in introducing her because she is my sister. Yep, she is. <laughs> I remember when I was about four or five years old and Heather was torturing me and beating on me and holding me down. Our mother, who was here today too, walked by, didn't stop it, but walked by and said, Heather, one day he's going to be big enough to get you back. Today's and today's the day. <laughs> the power I have right now. What I wouldn't have given for when I was five. But as all good younger brothers, I'll let Heather get away with it for now. Heather and I are from Rosewood, a rural community in Wayne County, North Carolina. Growing up, our idea of going abroad was a family trip at Epcot in Orlando. We graduated from the same rural consolidated high school, Southern Wayne. The school was surrounded by farm fields and in an era before air conditioning, when it reached 90 degrees, we would go home early because of heat and growing insect infestation. The only notable thing about our high school is that we were located down the road from Mount Olive, which is home of Mount Olive Pickles. On a breezy day, you could smell the processing of pickles. And I gotta tell you, they taste way better than they smell being processed. But there must have been something in that air, because we did all right. <laughs> yes. Um, but in that rural environment, I often wondered why did Heather choose the, the path she did? Why did she become interested in fashion and merchandising? And I think part of it has to do with watching our mother uh, make her prom dresses by hand, slaving over it for hours or, uh, late into the evening on a sewing machine that antique sewing machine that she got when she graduated uh, college. When Heather finished her BS in apparel and textiles at East Carolina University, uh, with significant hours in industrial technology and market, marketing, she was drawn to fashion merchandising and manufacturing. She wanted to learn more, and so quite right after graduating at ECU, she took 18 months and got a master's of textile degree from North Carolina State University. Her research project had focused on how to lay out t-shirt patterns and enormous sheets of cotton with the least amount of waste. But one day, one fortunate day, in the student union, she passed a desk with a binder on it. Now, if our director of career services was here, this would make her head explode. That binder was a career fair. Inside that binder, students were supposed to flip through job ads and find a job, write down the details and maybe apply for it later. In that binder was a job to work at Nike. Heather knew what Nike was, so she applied for it. And she became a manufacturing liaison networking with faculties in the regions where Nike made clothes and socks, including Central America and Canada. Before Thanksgiving of that, forever, that year, her address was with Nike in Charlotte, and then in a couple of years, she transferred to Jakarta, Indonesia, again in charge of regional manufacturers. In the late 1990s, 
Millions of those Tiger Wood khaki pants passed over her desk, and she helped ensure that Michael Jordan's closing specifications were met. Obviously, MJ liked his clothes big. After accepting a position at Nike in Jakarta, she then moved to Oregon, which was the home campus, and began working with manufacturers in, Ma in Mexico and South America, overseeing manufacturing of golf clothes, and again, continuing with Michael Jordan's brand. You can imagine that this was a great time for me. I got free stuff all the time. Um, it was wonderful. And then she took a job with Carter's Baby Clothes, and our relationship soured, to be honest. Uh, but she moved back to, uh, she took the job at Carter's in Atlanta to be closer to us, her mother, and the people that she loved. And she now in Atlanta, she works with manufacturing companies in Singapore, Hong Kong, Thailand, and China. Heather's life and career has taken her all over the world, and we are fortunate today that it has brought her here to UNA. Please welcome my sister, Heather Manso. Hi. Oh, it is working. Um, I'm so excited to be here today. I, I have such vivid memories of Matt so eloquently described our growing up in rural North Carolina, and I didn't, I, everybody I knew, their parents were teachers, doctors, lawyers, uh, nurses, farmers. None of them did anything like what I do today. I didn't know anything about it. So I, I'm so excited to be here today. Just if there's something I say today that gives you some glimming, glim or, or notion of something that you might be interested in, or maybe it, like you sometimes, it just, for me, if I heard about things, I'd be like, yeah, I don't want to do that. So maybe it'll narrow some focus for you, either saying I don't, I'm not interested in that, or I am. But if, it, if something today, if I say something that at least sparks something in you, I will have spent a well um, I will say this has been a great day. So I'm so excited to be here. Um, I, it's so strange for me to, to have my family in the audience, and it's, it's really special. You know, I grew up with my teachers. My parents were teachers, and Matt went into teaching, so I'm kind of the odd, the odd one out. Um, so I ended up at Carter's, Inc., so it's a baby clothes company. Um, it's crazy to me sometimes to think I've been there 18 years, and I look out in the audience, and probably been there as long as some of you have been around, but um, I don't know. I, I, when I tell that story, sometimes I say I was a child model when I started, so. Um, but this is a costume from one of our um, factories. We sell this now. Um, I thought it was appropriate, and a little avocado. He's so cute. So this is some of our marketing. So throughout the presentation, I just thought I'd pepper some of this in so you could see what our company does. Um, we make great, great kids' clothes for babies and children. Um, Commercialization. I, I put this up here because, yeah, I'm the vice president of product development commercialization, and a lot of people read that and they're like, what does commercialization mean? Um, we just renamed our department, actually, because we were product development sourcing, so I worked with factories for years. I've you know, been there a long time, and part of my job while I worked there was traveling overseas and negotiating with the vendors' costs and getting them uh, ready to manufacture uh, our garments. And now we have a Hong Kong office, and they do that. So I'm in the home office now, and my job is to make sure our team sends things to the Hong Kong office that we can manufacture and that we can afford to make. So that's why we have commercialization. It's, it's, it's not just product development. It's, make, it's making sure we can develop a product that we can sell and make a margin on. And um, if we don't keep that in mind, it's, it wouldn't we'd be sending things to Hong Kong and it would be more spin, so we try to make sure that we keep an eye on the costing piece of it. So that's kind of how commercialization came into the, uh, into the title, even though it is kind of a funny word. So a little bit about Carter's. Um, some of you may not know, do you know Carter's? I mean, I think if you have children, obviously you raise your hand, and a lot of you might probably wore it as kids, I know, probably I did. It's over a 100 year old, year old company. It was born in the Northeast of the US during the Industrial Revolution. I mean, it's been around forever. Um, so the brand was run by the family, and over time it, it got bought and sold, and now it's a public company, so you can look it up on the stock exchange, CRI. I think it's a great thing if you, to learn about companies, if they're public, to, to listen to their earnings calls if you ever get a chance to. It's a great way to expose yourself to things that I never did that, so I never knew until we became public, really. I never even looked up an earnings call to see what they talk about. Uh, it's a really interesting way to learn, though, and see what they're... Um, what's important to them and how they're selling themselves to the, to the, stock, to the street and to investors. Um, but we own Carter's, Oshkosh, and Skip Pop. I don't know if you've heard of Skip Pop. It's a small, new kind of company. It was um, started in New York City, a woman who 
You know, when you're in New York, you don't have a car. You have a stroller, right? Everything is on your stroller for your baby. And she was finding that she couldn't find things that would work well. So she decided to start a company. And they, for 12 years, they built up the company. And it's all about making things just better. And so last year, we bought the company. And it's part of our portfolio now. And it's just a great rounding out because it complements our brands. Um, we also make products for Target, special for Target, Walmart, and um, Amazon, obviously, is one of our new big customers. I think Amazon is changing the world, so it's, it's kind of an interesting thing to be in business with them. They're, they're challenging us to be, obviously, faster and better at what we do. Um, sometimes that's frustrating. But um, just a few things about Carter's. When I started working there, I came from Nike. I, I didn't know much about it. Um, and I don't mean to talk a lot about Carter's, but I know I have a lot of people in here with a lot of different majors. So I wanted to talk a little bit about an apparel, a global apparel company and just kind of what we do. Um, and then I'll kind of backtrack and talk a little bit about kind of how I got there. But Carter's, just the volume of what we do and why we um, are so big. I mean, there's 4 million babies born in the U.S. a year. Um, and those babies wear a lot of clothes every day. You think about what they do. They spit up, right? And think about the fact that a baby goes through in a year probably three sizes of clothes. We don't, hopefully, go up or down that much, but babies do. So um, it's, it's a huge volume market, and Carter's is about 25% of the, of the market in the U.S. It's a $9 billion industry in the U.S., and we're about 25%, 26% of it. It's a big, um, big number. So we make about 450 million selling units a year across the globe. Um, we have it in 12 countries. We have about 200 manufacturing sites. We don't own them. Most brands don't own their factories anymore. They contract a factory that... The factories are specialists in making garments, and they work with several brands to make sure that, you know, they don't have all their eggs in one basket. So that's kind of what I've done over the, my career at Carter's is travel to those factories and negotiated pricing with them, making sure they can make our product, make sure it's safe, uh, make sure the, the working conditions are good at the factory, and make sure that um, they can hit our prices, most importantly, obviously. Um, so one of the things, when I say... Um, 450 million selling units. Most of the things we sell are in packs. So it's really when you get up to the number of pieces we make, it's almost a billion. So it's really kind of mind-boggling. Um, coming from Nike even, that was mind-boggling to me, uh, the numbers. And that's a lot of factories that we have to work with. That network is pretty intensive um, to work with. But then when you talk about we well, are so dominant in the U.S. market, so what do you do to grow when you're so dominant in the market? And that means you have to go outside your market. So China, there's 16, actually 17 billion kids born a year, babies born a year. It's quite a bit more than in the U.S., right? India is even more than that. So you look at a company like us, and you're like, we have to grow internationally. We have to. Um, there's, just, there's no way around it. So a few years ago, about six years ago, we started our, whoa. I don't know how that happened. Here we go. We, we opened a Hong Kong office. Um, six years ago. So before that, I was in charge of me and a handful of people were in charge of going to Asia. I went like four times a year for two months at a time, two weeks at a time. So it's two months of the whole year I was in Asia traveling to factories, um, checking on our production and negotiating with them. But now our Hong Kong office kind of took over that. And that's why we also have some satellite offices. So we have people, we call it boots on the ground, boots on the ground to check on the factories and make sure that um, they're producing our product in that factory number one, and not subconning it to someone else. Um, we also, Skip Hop has an office in Shenzhen. We have a Shanghai office, too, that's not even on here, that's to help grow our, our China business. Um, with all those babies being born every year, we definitely want to make sure we're, we're starting to connect with a Chinese consumer. You know, China, India, the growing middle class, we want to tap into them, make sure they're buying our products. So that international um, expansion, not only in China, but also we have... Um, licensees all over the world. So a lot of companies, they don't have sales forces in every country, so they'll have a company that they hire to license their product. So they'll, they'll give them the opportunity to sell our product in that country, and they'll pay us a royalty. Um, some of those partners were really important to us, and we actually have acquired a couple of them just to bring them into our, in our corporate um, company. So that's what we did in Toronto. We bought a company up there a couple years ago, and we now have an office there with people who work to sell the product in Canada. And then we also just this past year bought one of our licensees that was in Me the biggest one in Mexico. So now we have an office in Mexico City. So what, with this expansion, I've seen a lot of opportunity for my colleagues who do speak other languages. Um, two of my colleagues actually moved to Mexico City in the past year 
to take over um, and be the liaison there and, and be, help them learn the Carters, more about our Carters business and help them integrate into our company. So I think one of the things when we talk about language and expansion globally, I know there's a lot of um, focus on language here, and I think, you know, um, I think language is such a great complement to what people can do in their careers. It, it gives you a competitive advantage that um, when people look for resumes, if, you're, if a company like mine, if we were just hiring recently for a person who's going to go and, and work with some of the manufacturers in the Western Hemisphere, and, and we had to have a Spanish speaker, you know, so I think... You know, language may not be the most important part of your resume, but it is such an layer, interesting layer on your resume that can really help you get in, open doors for you. And so the, my colleagues that just moved to Mexico City, I don't think they ever thought they would really move there. But it was a great opportunity for them. So um, whether language is your main focus or just a part of your focus, I, I think it's really neat to kind of look up companies and, and learn about them and where they're located. Um, in Atlanta, we have um, several German companies. We have Porsche and, and Mercedes who have offices there for the US, and so a lot of German-speaking friends of mine, they work there, it's a great opportunity for them. It gives them such a leg up because they speak the language of the home office. So, I ch you know, I think that's one of my biggest points of advice is if when you're looking for a career, if you do speak another language, understand what companies are in those countries that you speak that language of. And then understand where they are globally because that might give you um, a lead into where you might want to work or what you might want to do. Because um, we, we don't really hire uh, translators in our world, in our industry but it, it's something that people do that helps them kind of catapult their career in different directions. Um, I work with a lot of people who didn't go to school for apparel and textiles. I'm, I'm kind of an anomaly, someone that studied it. A lot of people came into our world from business and different other things, and they learned the apparel side of it. Um, it it's, I often tell people it's not rocket science, you know, but um, maybe it, it, it is to some people. But um, So I just want to talk for a minute about because I know there's some fashion merchandising students, and I just want to talk a minute about our life cycle of our product, just a little bit about kind of how things move through the, our, our company um, and the, the different departments that I work with. So obviously I'm in the product development team, which is the number five. The blue line in the middle is our product development life cycle. It's roughly 42 weeks. So in my office this week, we've been looking at the fall 19 line, kind of the designers just finished it. We're getting ready to sample it, and we'll, make costs, we'll get the vendors to cost it out for us. So we're about a year ahead. This is probably a very traditional model. I think you've probably read articles about Zara and H&M with fast fashion. This is very traditional, and this is the kind of old way, but this is the traditional way. We're, we were traditionally a wholesale company, so that's kind of where this calendar came from. Um, there's lots of different models that people execute to get faster, um, and we do have products that we do, but this is just the traditional model that most of our products go through. So obviously, it all starts with our merchandising team. We hire a lot of fashion merchandising students um, into this department. Uh, some of them, a lot of them have come from FSG for some reason. Um, but they're the ones that kind of build out the line for the season. They say how many we need. We need 20 t-shirts and 20 pair of pants and 20, 10 costumes like the avocado. Um, and then they decide what we want to sell that for. And they give that to the design team and the design team then obviously puts color to it. They make those garments. They decide what pattern to use, what art will go on it, and they work with the art and tech teams to make that happen. So between one, two, three, and four, that's where kind of all the magic happens, where the product's designed. And then it gets handed to the product development team. We make a bill of materials, and then we work with our Hong Kong team to get samples made and costs done. Um, and then once it's ready, it's signed off by the design team and everybody, then it goes into production. And our operation team obviously is in charge of telling us how much we need to buy because we know how many customers we, we have. We have like 800 stores in the U.S. and 17,000 wholesale distribution doors. So, and then we have our international partners that we buy for. So we have tons of volumes. So the operation team kind of, and they, none of the operations team studied apparel and textiles. They're all the people I go to for my Excel advice. They are business people, analytics. Um, but they're the ones that tell us how many we need. And then they work with the transportation teams to get it here. So... The supply chain kind of starts from product development through global transportation. When you hear the word supply chain, it's kind of the, in our world especially, it's product development through till it gets to the store. Um, I mentioned Amazon a minute ago. Amazon has changed our industry. You know, you can order something right now as you're sitting there and it can be in your home. It depends on where you are. It could be there this afternoon or tomorrow, right? It's just changed the, the retail industry dramatically. And we spend a lot of time thinking about how much money we want to spend on getting the product to the consumers quicker 
or do we spend money on making a better product, or do we, how do we spend our money and, and to make it better? And, and Amazon is really challenging the whole supply chain to try to think differently. It's a really interesting time in our industry because it's really, it's everything, all the rules have kind of started changing. Amazon's changed that because they look at things differently and they try different things. Um, it's just a real interesting, um, interesting time. So, obviously I started, in, I'm in the product development team and I work closely in my Hong Kong office. Um, but I started my career at Nike, as Matt mentioned. Um, I was working in sourcing and contract manufacturing. Started in Charlotte, right there. Um, you know, it wasn't far from where I grew up. And um, like you said, I found out about the job, just happened to be thumbing through a binder and found the job. And I, and I still, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew kind of, I didn't want to be a retail buyer and I didn't want to be in a factory. I knew I wanted to be somewhere between that design and the factory, and I didn't even know what it was called. Um, so when I was at NC State, they, that's where I kind of learned a little bit more about what was in that middle ground. Now, now they're sourcing, and, and you know more about product development, but back, back when I was in the school, I didn't, I didn't really know enough. So I did have a good advisor, and she really mentored me and helped me learn and kind of get on the path, and that's when I started working on markers and efficiencies of the fabric and things like that, and kind of got me interested in the, in the industry and how costing is such a big part of it. Like, I, I hated math and economics. You know, I was, an art, I was into art, drawing, and, and clothes. I thought, I'll never need math. I'll never need economics. But when you get into go making garments, you have to know how much they cost. And now, the global economy, I spend a lot of time studying the, you know, the cotton, the price of cotton and, and what's happening in commodity pricing, oil pricing. We make a lot of polyester garments. Oil prices directly affect that. So I never thought I would be so interested in these things um, coming through school because I was, oh, I'm just going to work on clothes and, and that'll be it. But and, um, I spent a lot of time in Excel, math, working on things that I never thought I would do. But um, as you evolve in your career, you kind of you realize some of those things and those classes I had to take. I wish I'd have paid more, a little more attention, but thank goodness for Google because I use that a lot. <laughs> um, but it's just interesting. Um, as, the, as I evolved in my career, I, you know, I, I just kind of... I, sometimes I feel like it was accidental, I don't know, happy accidents, but when I started in Charlotte, I, I was just a sponge. I just, I said, let me do everything I can do. I went to factories all the time. I got to learn. I even, they let me practice on a screen printing machine because we went to the factory one time. I think mom, you even went with me one time. So I got to do a lot of hands-on things and, you know, every year we get an annual review and, you know, on the annual review they would tell me, you know, what I'm doing good or what my challenges are. And there was always a section at the bottom where they would say, what are your future interests, and would you ever relocate? And I'd always check yes for relocation, thinking that maybe I one day to go to Oregon. And one day, they came to the head of the office came to came and sat down and said, "Would you go to Jakarta?" And I didn't even know where Jakarta was really. Um, I had to look it up on my, the map in my file of my you know day timer because we didn't have the, you know Google then. Um, and two months later, I was on a plane. So it kind of was a strange, scary exciting time in my life. It was one of those things where an opportunity dropped in my lap. They had asked three other people before me. They all had families, kids. They couldn't go. School just started. So here I was, 26. I didn't own anything. I, I could go. And so I said yes. And it was probably the, um, I still can't believe my mom and dad let me go. <laughs> but um, it was scary. I mean, we didn't have, you know, I didn't have a cell phone when I lived there. You know, I had email. My dad and mom would email me every day. And I'd get phone calls every once in a while from the landline. But we didn't have all the communication we had today. So it was a really lonely time, actually. I mean, I met a lot of people there. It was, that's the one thing about living abroad that I would say I, I recommend it so much. Because when people are abroad, you're isolated. And you kind of get connected to people because you're a little isolated. And it's a really neat experience. Because they, I remember I got a phone call from a person I met one time. She said, you want to come to my house for dinner? And I'm like, I just met you one time. Wow. But that's what happens when you're in kind of a small environment like that, where you're all kind of in a space that you're, you're outsiders. And so it was really neat. Um, so if you ever get the chance, even if it's scary or to a place you've never heard of, I would do it. I would do it again. It, I really learned a lot. I was in the first day I landed in Jakarta for my job. I, uh, two days later, they put me on a flight to central Java to a factory. It was one of those planes where I don't think it had been maintained very much, it made lots of noises. And uh, it was terrifying, but um, I had to do that every few weeks. 
for a while, and, and that was a factory that luckily, we kind of would rotate which factories we would take care of. You know, we, we would be their main contact, and luckily that factory, I didn't have to main, be their main contact for too long, because that was a scary thing, but it was a great adventure. Have you ever heard of durian fruit? Do you know what that is? It's, the, it's a prickly fruit, and it smells awful. And tastes, I think, awful, but it's banned on planes in J Indonesia because it stinks so bad. Well, I was traveling one time with my QA team, and, and of course, the best durian is from where that factory was, and he had to smuggle some back, and so we're sitting on the plane, it's like an hour flight, and this whole plane starts smelling, and it doesn't smell good. It really smells like bodily function, like it smells really bad. But um, I don't know, that's one of my best, one of, <laughs> one of my best memories of, uh, my travels through Jakarta and Central Java. But um, anyway, I, I learned a lot through that. I mean, it's scary and it's interesting. And, and I guess I can confess this now. I don't speak any other languages. I'm an English speaker. I know that's horrible. I wish I had learned a language. I struggled through Spanish and French. I should have just stayed with one. That was my big mistake. And then, but when I got to Indonesia, I started learning a little bit. I don't know if anyone's from Indonesia in here. Is there anyone? I can practice the three words, four words I know. Um, but anyway, I, I wish I had learned a language. So if you're, if you're studying another language, I think it's wonderful. I think it opens doors for you. I think it, it gives you something that you can talk to other people about, even if it's not a language that will be part of your career. I just think it gives you a, a layer in your personality that's just really interesting. And I, I wish I spoke another language. You know, I can butcher some things, but I don't. But I learned a lot going overseas. I think it's something that if you ever get a chance to do, you should do. Um, I was there about two and a half years, and they moved me back to the home office in Oregon. And this was really, they had closed the Charlotte office by the time while I was in Indonesia. So that was in the late 90s, and factories in the U.S. were starting to slowly close. Um, it was, I mean, I think NAFTA was right after that, right before that. So um, it was a weird time. I mean, I'd never been to Oregon maybe once. It was scary to go from a country for two and a half years where I, I, you know, and not coming back home, I went to another place. Uh, but it was neat. I actually would run into Phil Knight, literally, like at the lunch cafeteria sometimes. It's really cool. Um, I just read his book, Shoe Dog. I don't know. Has anyone read that book? I think it's a great, I don't know, if you're interested in, in Nike and companies like that, it's a really, it's a great memoir because you kind of can see into him and, and how he grew up in the, and how he grew his company. It's fascinating to me. It didn't happen very easily or overnight, and so I just have a lot of respect for that. Um, but living in Oregon, it was great, but I was, you know, I had been gone for a long time, and I wanted to get back to the East Coast. I think you're either an East or West Coast, or I don't know, that's just in my head. I feel like you're either one or the other, and I felt like I wanted to be back on the East Coast, I, and I'd been at Nike six years. I, I kind of wanted to spread my wings a little bit, you know, do something else. So I, I put out my resume. The first one that came back was Carter's. It was a small company outside of Atlanta, old company. The office was really small, overlooked a cemetery. It was, so I left Beaverton. I don't know if you've seen pictures of the Beaverton home office for Nike. It's amazing. It's beautiful. So I left there, got on a flight, landed in, North, in uh, Atlanta, and showed up at this rear, really, is really literally called the Drury Inn. I don't know if you ever heard of that hotel. And, had an, and I, don't, I don't know what I was doing. I was like, why am I here? This is awful. But I interviewed that next day with like eight people, and they offered me a job at the end of the day, and I thought, this is crazy. But it was, a, it was one of those things. It was like I felt like it, it was meant to happen. It was meant to be, so I did it. Some days I, I know Matt did not like that I left Nike. I'm sorry. I still have some of the samples from that day, like the bags and things. Um, but Carter's was a great opportunity for me to kind of come into a company that was small, I actually took a step back. When I was working at Nike, I'd moved, you know, worked my way up to manager, so I, I was making big deals, and I felt like I was really moving along in my career, but at Carter's, they said, I want you to take a step back and kind of start in the ground level, learn the ground level, and then move up, and so begrudgingly, I did. It was a good decision, though, because I spent a little time just learning the meat of the company, and then I got moved up to manager, and then director, and, you know, kept moving up and, and growing my career, and, and all that time at Car at Carter's, I was traveling so much more. I mean, at Nike, I moved overseas, but at Carter's, I got to travel. I was in different countries all the time. It was great. It was a little scary, though. Um, some of the stories I can't tell because my mom's here. Just kidding. Um, just making sure I check my notes if there was anything I wanted to miss. So, um, 
I have a really good friend, you know, I, I confess to you I don't speak other languages. I have a really good friend who does. She speaks German and Spanish. She works with Lufthansa Cargo in Atlanta. Like I said, there's a lot of German companies in Atlanta. And she said, what are you going to teach people about language? You know, like, and I said, well, I can teach them how I've done it, how I've gotten around, like how, how I've kind of experienced it, like working with comp you know, people who don't speak English as their native language and what I've done. And so she and I, over dinner one night, she was kind of giving me some ideas and we were bouncing them off each other. And that's what this list came from. It's just kind of things we kind of were thinking of. And, and some of them are very obvious and some of them may not be extremely obvious. But obviously when you're working with people from other countries that may not, maybe not be native English speakers, um, sometimes think about it. Sometimes English isn't even their second language. It might be their third or fourth. Especially if you're dealing with people from Europe, a lot of them know many languages and, and English is one that they learned maybe as a third or fourth language. But avoid colloquialisms, obviously, like that some of those phrases we say all the time, a lot of sports phrases, you know, let's touch base on that, or that's a home run. You know, my, people in my Hong Kong office kind of look at me sometimes, I have to explain them. Um, speak slowly and clearly, um, almost to the point of being, feels unnatural sometimes. And remember American and British English are different. One of my, she had a funny experience recently with a meeting and someone asked to go to the loo and the people in the Atlanta office were like, what is she talking? What is the loo? You know, it's the bathroom, restroom. Um, the next one is really important, I think. Don't try to use your language as a competitive advantage. You know, I, I've, I've sat at a table many times negotiating pricings with a, with a factory, and um, I've seen people kind of, and we all know bullies, and that's kind of how it comes across, as, as, and it builds distrust with the person you're working with. If, if, if you try to talk fast to try to get them to agree to something, and I've seen kind of people do this in kind of a negotiation setting, and, and, and that's, that's just not the right way to, to do things. You want to make sure you're being respectful to that person. Um, so oftentimes, you know, I'll, I'll stop them and I'll say, your English is much better than my Mandarin or much better than my Thai. So don't worry about what you sound like. You are much better than if I try to speak your language. So that's one of the things I try to break the ice with a lot with when I talk to people. Um, and appreciate their speaking your language. You know, be patient. Um, try to be very gracious. Learn little things, like, you know, I tried to learn a little something in every country. Of course, I was embarrassed, with, you know, to do it, but it, they would often laugh at me, but it would be fun, like in Thailand, you know, swadika, and it sounds ridiculous, but it meant something to them for me to say that and do that when I greeted them. Um, and not even knowing the language, like, you know, you might speak Japanese, but you meet someone from China and, and you say, oh, I don't speak Mandarin, but I speak Japanese, and they may know some Japanese. So making sure if you do speak another language, talk about it with anybody, you know, talk about it with people, because it might be a bridge to um, give you something in common with them. Um, I think that's really important when you're talking about business, because, you know, everyone will learn English in a business setting to talk to each other. But my friend talked a lot about how you know, in business, it's good to have a bridge, something to give you, uh, something to talk about with someone. You know, often sometimes it'll be like, how are your kids? You know, you, something in common with them. Language can be that too. Um, and even if you don't speak well, try. Um, I never felt confident doing that, but it's perceived very well. Um, this next thing is a little bit of an editorial piece for me. I, I, talk, I have a lot of people in my team that come in, they're beginning their careers. I have a person on my team that did an internship in Hong Kong actually last year. She was coming out, I think she came out of one of the universities up near Chicago. And now she's on my team. Um, she speaks Mandarin, so that's one of the reasons she was able to get the internship in Hong Kong. Um, but I talk a lot in my team about building themselves and, and building their career and kind of how they're gonna move in their career. Um, and the main thing is you own it you know, your path and the way you're going to build your career and your decisions you make in life, you own that. What you have right now, you know, you have your base. We all have our base of who we are, and that's our education, our personality, and our values. Those are kind of those core things um, that kind of are, are who you are, but that, that's your base, I feel like, these things, like what you're doing now, giving yourself a good education, figuring out what you want to do with your life, but this is your base. Um, and then how others see you is really how you talk to them, verbal, nonverbal, um, you know, they may not understand who you are and your personality and your values and your education, how smart you are, unless you communicate well with them. Um, and that's one of the things that I, I've had to really learn a lot in the past few months. I, I wasn't very comfortable speaking in front of people, and a few years ago, someone said, yeah, Heather, you really need to start doing that. If you want to grow in your career, you need to start getting in front of people and communicating with them and letting them see who you are and what you're about. And I started doing that and taking advantage of when presentations were coming about, things I would have sat back and said, mm, you can do that. 
I started doing it, and it's amazing. All of a sudden, things just started clicking, and people would say, I never knew your point of view. I never heard your voice. It was amazing. So even though I worked really hard and I did a good job, I wasn't getting out there and letting people see me speak and let it, letting people see who I was. And as soon as I did, things started opening up. So I just, I, I think, you know, especially, it's really important in this day and age. A lot of us spend a lot of time on our phones. So face-to-face -face communication sometimes is, is not um, something people are comfortable with, you know? But I think it's really important to figure out how you can communicate with people because one of the things we talk a lot about at my company is a personal brand. Um, it's kind of a strange thing to think about, but you think about someone like Kim Kardashian, right? She is definitely a brand. Um, what it stands for, I have no idea. But you know who she is. Everybody knows who she is, right? Um, but you have, a, you, you have to build your personal brand and, and, and understand that people, everything you do, it, it's creating a brand about what people, how people see you and what, how people um, think about you. So if you're always late to a meeting, that's part of your personal brand. You're, you're always late. Um, if you, you know, speak up in meetings, if you have good ideas, that's your personal brand. You know, just think about how you want others to see you. It's really important. Um, I mean, in a corporate setting, we talk about it a lot because obviously we, everything we do at corporate is very collaborative. We do a lot of meetings all day long. Um, so I think this is just this concept. This, and it doesn't have to be a corporate setting. It can be in any setting. But how people see you is so important. So I, just, I talk about this a lot with the people that come to work for me because you know, they're like, how do I get promoted? Or how do I do this? And how do I? I'm like, well, you're in control of that. You know? Every bit of your career and, and where you're going, you're in control. Like, I was in control of whether I went to Jakarta or not and, and what my experiences were there. And um, some of it, though, was luck. <laughs> you know, some of it was just experiences that I had lead me to where I am. There's timing drive, decisions, and opportunities, all these things kind of around you, but you're in control of it. And I think that's what I wanted to make sure. Um, you, take, you have to take some pride in that. Things are not going to just fall on your doorstep, even though sometimes you feel like um, what is luck, it's half opportunity, and I forget that saying. Anyway, things happen to you if you let them, but it, it, you're in charge of it, and I just think take, figure it out. You don't have to figure it all out today, and, that's, and I just certainly didn't when I was your age, but... Um, it'll be something that evolves with you, but you take control of it and figure out what your path will be and understand that everything you do is kind of a piece of that. So that was kind of my speech, kind of what I've done and how I've gotten to where I am. Um, I don't know. Are there any questions? No? I don't know. Yes? Hi. So you have 4 million babies born in the United States. Has that number gone up or down in the past five years? Yes. You're exactly right. The, the birth rate has been dropping in the U.S. It's under four million now. Um, it's uh, people are waiting later to have babies. You know, people are having careers and doing things, and they're waiting till later. A part of that, right? Um, and Toys R Us went under last year. So yeah, the we were my company was a wholesale company. Sorry, a wholesale company. And so a lot of those big wholesale companies like Babies R Us has gone. And so we spent a lot of the last years, how do you grow a company when some of your biggest customers are going out? And that, again, is where the international market comes, becomes so important. Uh, I've been involved in many projects over the past year to grow internationally. I know you probably bought things from Zara and H&M, and the labels are like this long, have all these languages. Um, when you're making it for a baby garment, the garments are this big and the label's this big and you've got to figure out what to do. I mean, that's been a big project we've worked on because we, ha we have to grow internationally, to your point. Um, the U.S. market is, is not growing. Um, so that is why we're going to other countries and, and focused on that. And that's why we're buying other companies. You know, we bought Skip Hop to kind of round, and that's what a lot of people do. They buy, they put several companies in a portfolio so that as things ebb and flow. We also started our Age Up initiative, which... We didn't go up to size 14 until this past year for Carter's, and that's what we did to kind of grow in those larger sizes. So we, it's definitely been our top of mind concern is the birth rate and how to grow in this market. We also started a preemie line this past year. We, we sell preemie product, but never in a big way. Um, but there's a lot of people waiting later to have babies, so there's a lot of multiples. So that means a lot of babies are born smaller than they used to be. So we're doing a lot of research. How do you grow when, things, when the things in your landscape is changing? Um, so that was a good question. Thank you. Yes? For our baby products, um, Old Navy is one of our biggest. Um, 
in, a, in kids wear, it is uh, the children's place, I would say. Uh, we do a lot of competitive reviews every year. Our merchandising team's in charge of that. They'll go out and buy competitor products and bring it back and we'll, we'll all study it. We'll look at how they're selling, what prices they're selling things at. Target, Cat and Jack, I don't know if you've heard of the Cat and Jack line. Cat and Jack is a new baby or kids wear line that Target literally created out of the blue two years ago. It didn't exist two years ago and now it's one of the highest ranked kids apparel companies in the country. Um, they just created it. It's cute, um, but they're one of our biggest competitors as well. Yeah, good question. Anything else? Yes? Um, so can you talk a little bit about one of the more uh, interesting stories abroad that you experienced? <laughs> I know our mother is here, so keep yeah. clean. But, uh, yeah. The, the durian one was a good one. I love that story. But um, when I, I moved to Jakarta, thank you, because I forgot to tell this one. I moved to Jakarta in May of 97. No, November of 97. I'm getting so old that the years run together. Um, and then in May of 98, there was a political upheaval and riots started and, and they were, didn't want the president to be in, in office anymore. And so were riots in the street and we were all locked in our homes for several days watching CNN. I mean, I was so young, 26, I didn't really understand. Now looking back, I'm like, oh my God, that's awful. Um, I mean, I could look out the window of my apartment and see uh, smoke billowing up because they were burning stores. It was crazy. Um, and then they decided that we would do a convoy to an airport to kind of escape the country. So at 2 o'clock one night, we all met and take, I had a driver there. That, I forgot to say that. It was really cool at 26 to have a car because I couldn't drive there. The traffic was kind of crazy. So this guy, he was my driver. It was awesome. I mean, now we all have Uber and Atlanta, so I feel like I have a personal driver again, but it's kind of crazy. But we took our personal, they drove us to the airport and there we were going by tanks and people with military guns and it was, it was crazy. And for a long time after that, our office would have armed guards. But we were flown out of the country on a, a plane full of, we had about 50 people in that office that were expats. They would, they'd flow us to Singapore overnight. And that was probably the scariest experience. We had to, they, I mean, they made us keep a lot of cash on us in our apartments. We had a safe and they would say, always keep cash there because if we are evacuated, you might have to spend a lot of money to get out of the country. So it was we all that day were really thankful they made that rule and we had to pay a lot of money to get out of the country, but it was, it was crazy. I landed in Singapore, didn't sleep, because at 2 a.m. is when we met to have the convoy and we flew out about six. It was, as the sun was rising, we were taken off to Singapore. I got to Singapore airport and I took a quick shower and I went and I said, I need a flight to Raleigh-Durham. <laughs> and I flew home. I'd already been, I was supposed to go home in a week, a week from that already, so I, I did that. But that was probably the scariest time. Um, there was often things that would happen that we couldn't go to work. You know, there would be riots or, or some kind of political demonstration. So that had become a part of our lives there, but um, it was kind of interesting. People would have cook cookouts and you go to their house and it would be, we couldn't go to work that day, so we'd all just get together and have a barbecue. But it was scary times, it really was. Um, I look back and can't believe I did it. And if my child ever comes to me wanting to do that, I, I don't know that I would want them to. But... Uh, that was one of them. Anything else? Yes? Can you talk a little bit more about mentoring? Yeah, mentoring, we have an extensive mentoring program at Carter's and over my, the course of my career, I mentioned at NC State, I had a really great advisor and she became a mentor to me and really kind of guided me on the way. And, and in undergrad, I had one as well. In my first job at Nike, I had one. So I think at every phase in my life, I kind of had that one person I kind of went to for advice. And a lot of them I still am in touch with. Um, at Carter's, I've had a couple as well. That People I would meet, the companies that I worked with, um, that you, know, you just kind of connect with, and, and they connect with you, and, and you ask advice. Um, but mentor, I, do, I do recommend you find someone like that to bounce ideas off of and to understand what you're, kind of get um, another voice, an opinion, someone who's had some experience in what you're interested in. It's, it's a great way to, to grow and to find out things. Um, our mentor program, we actually have a mentor program in my company, and we have a reverse mentor program where some of the older people in our organization have mentors who are millennials for the opposite reason, because you want to learn from, I mean, our consumers are millennial moms, basically, so we want to learn what, what motivates a millennial mom. So I think that, one's a, that one, to me, is a great experience. Um, but yeah, 
we have a mentor, and I have a mentor right now, and, and they, they often give, we do personality tests, and they put you with someone that either you compliment or maybe you're opposites, and that's always really neat. But I do, I think mentoring is great. I do have this slide that I promised my HR department I would show you. We have some great programs at Carter's. Um, we have a internship program for people who are still in the university. It's 11 weeks. Um, and then we also have an executive development program that's a six month program where you can work at our company. So we have a lot of people that, take, that do this coming from colleges all over the southeast. And if you're interested, you can go to our website. There's a, um, you don't have to go to a black ring binder like I did. <laughs> you can go to our website, and at the bottom there's careers. And you can look, I looked up this morning, and there's, they're not posted right now. I think they post more toward the end of a semester maybe. Um, I can find out and let you know more when the postings come about. But they're a great program. And what they do, you see in the bottom right, that was their intern. So they don't just bring them into the company. All the ones they bring into the company, they keep as a group and they do events with them and teach them, you know, take them to different things in Atlanta. They do a lot of, our HR department does a lot of coaching with us. So I talked about uh, your personal brand. That's one of the big coaching things they do. They do a lot of development, personal development uh, training with people. And they, they do it with this program. And I think it's a great way to learn about how to, how to live in a, and work in a corporate environment. It is very different than a, than a, um, a college university environment. It's very collaborative, um, so you kind of get a highlight of that. Um, I would recommend it to anybody. I have, I think, did I mention someone did an internship in Hong Kong and now she's working for me now? So it's just a great opportunity, I think, if, you, if you're interested. I think a lot of companies might do something like this, um, but I recommend it, it's good. Yes? Mm -hmm. I mean, the one thing that I learned when I went to graduate school was how we did a bunch of projects in graduate school. And I was like, why are we doing this? And, that, and it was because when you get in the corporate world, you're going to work in projects with people. It's, so, uh, it's a lot, and, it, and they, I know it's a lot at Carter's, but a lot of companies, it's very cross-functional and very collaborative. So even though projects may in, seem like really frustrating because you're having to depend on other people to help you with things, I always hated projects because of that. A little bit of a control freak sometimes. But um, it's really important to learn how to work in those projects and succeed uh, in a project environment because that is that is the corporate culture. So learning how to do that well. I think advice as far as like figuring out what you want to do. I think you guys are so lucky and, and you have so many things at your fingertips with just the internet. You can go online and, and look up any company in the world and kind of where they have openings, where they're located, what kind of jobs they have. Um, you know, just understand there's just so much opportunity at your fingertips that I just never had. Um, I think just take some interest. Maybe it's just a clothing, maybe it's a line, you know, something you like. Um, just start there and start researching and, and figuring it out. I think, you know, social media is a great way to kind of learn things. I follow a lot of people on social media that have different companies and brands, and that just helps me kind of learn what's out in the market. But I think if you're an, interested in, in a certain industry, follow some of the companies in that industry on social media and learn what they're talking about. Like I said, listen to an earnings call. Those are really dry, but sometimes they're just really interesting, too, to see what people are talking about. We listen um, to ours together and our teams, and then we talk about them afterwards. We listen to our competitors' earnings calls and cringe sometimes at what they say. It's really, those are really interesting just to learn what people, what, what's on the pulse of a public company and what they're interested in. Um, so yeah, I, is that anything else? Yep. Well, thank you. I really appreciate everything you said about the need for languages and also everything that you said about that cultural literacy and the importance of, of traveling abroad. Um, I'm interested in what, you know, the global economy and mm -hmm. the fact that you guys just partnered with Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, I mean, that is a big part of what we do um, as you're learning to grow in a global environment. I mean, Amazon, you know, we look at Amazon as changing kind of our, our culture in the U.S. because it, obviously that's where they're mainly based. But there's other companies. So that's where we're focused on speed to market. Like, how are we getting things to our consumer faster? How are we, when she's clicking that buy, how are we getting it to her faster? So when Amazon is, is all about speed and how can you take something from concept to, to the shelf or 
online to her doorstep faster. So they're really challenging us. I think the global economy, yes. I think people that have languages, and I think Matt asked me this earlier too, I think people who didn't speak languages will be less and less as you go forward. I think because of the global economy, people are gonna, I think language is gonna become even more important as a competitive advantage. If you want to you know, move within the global uh, corporate environment, I think knowing other languages is definitely something that's gonna benefit you. I know a lot of people are learning Mandarin. I mean, you know, China's huge, and, and I think that's wonderful. My, my colleagues in the Hong Kong office are learning Mandarin, and I think it's great. Um, I do think that people like me who don't speak languages are fewer and fewer. More and more I meet people who do, you know, in my industry. So yes, I think language is gonna be something that's even more important. Um, and the, the world is getting smaller. Um, I think, you know, companies that send people overseas. When, when I first started at Nike, they would send people to Charlotte to work, kind of get some experience, and then they would send them overseas to work. It was kind of this uh, normal cadence. And, but now they don't really do that anymore because there's so much talent around the world. You can hire an American in Hong Kong. You don't have to ship them there. There's so many that are already there, right? And they might already speak Mandarin. So there's, there's, there's people already around that you, know, you don't have to kind of cultivate it yourself um, because there are people already interested in it. But I, I do think that's where you can kind of figure out um, how to use language as your benefit for that. And that's what I think, um, I'm a, I think Matt called me a dying breed, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, literally. Anything else? It's been so great to talk to you today. I know I was a little nervous starting because I, uh, I left my notes in the hotel. Uh, so I had all these great notes and I'm, I left them. So I felt I was flying a little blind, but I, I think I got most of my stories in, but I was a little nervous when we started because I was at, without my notes. But um, Anyway, I hope something I said today meant something to you. I don't know, Matt, if you want to do some Q&A. You mentioned asking a few questions. But if you guys haven't, I think we're almost done. So anything else?